Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Safraz Manzor. Welcome to this special platform discussion <coughs> about Behind the Beautiful Forevers. Um, before we start, could we just see a show of hands? Who's already seen the play? That was a voice rather than a hand. But yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so a few. And who is, who's seeing it tonight now? In, okay, so the majority. Okay. So no That's spoilers helpful. No then. spoilers. Yeah. Right. Um, so with me are... Mira Sayal, who barely needs an introduction, um, an actress of stage, screen, and uh, television, and, um, and Rufus Norris, who directed the play and is going to be taken on, taking over as artistic director in the beginning of April? That's right. Something like that. Um, so let's start with you, Rufus. When did you first hear about the book? Um, I was uh, approached um, by Nick Heitner. Um, in fact... That isn't quite how it happened. I, I, I was given a call by Scott Rudin, who uh, some of you may know is an American producer. Uh, he's one of the most um, powerful American producers. And he, I got a call from him saying, can we meet for a lunch uh, at which there is no agenda? <laughs> and there's, there's no such thing as a no agenda lunch with Scott Rudin. So, uh, so I turned up and we chatted very merrily for about 57 minutes. And at the end, he said, do you know this book? Uh, OK. So that's, and lo and behold, the next day, the script turned up, the first draft that David had done. That was about probably 20 months ago. So I think the order of events was that Catherine published the book. Scott, as he does, you know, uh, uh, found out about it very quickly, approached Catherine and said, look, you know, the, the obvious thing is to make a film, but actually it feels more like this is a, this is a play. And uh, can we... Uh, can we talk to David Hare? And uh, Catherine, I think, instinctively said no. Um, and then she went and asked the residents of Anawadi, and they said, why not? You know, um, and that was, for her, the, the, the green light. So then David did the first draft, and I, and I, and I read that. I mean, it's, it's, the book is, if, for those of you who have read it, is an immersive piece of non-fiction. I think she lived there for three years or something like that. It's immensely detailed. It almost has the character of, of a novel. To try and transfer that onto stage, that was quite a, da quite a daunting thing? Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to expand on that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's, there's so many layers of it. I mean, you know, yeah, putting, putting, you know I've done a few big shows on this stage, um, and, uh, you know, that's a thing in itself, but that's my job, that's what I do. So you can, you can kind of work into that and go, well, how are we going to do that? Very close work with the designer, who, uh, you know, this is about our 30th show together. Um, so th that's a very well practiced um, uh, conversation. Much more, much more, um, I think, challenging is the fact that these are real people, and and Catherine's Catherine's connection to it is so forensic um, that the duty to that is 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 sort of overwhelming, and that's, that, that, that was really, that's really, really difficult. And then you're really in an in a, in, in a unknown terrain. Well, we can talk about some of the ethical things about that. What persuaded you to, to take this on? Well, weirdly, I I'd read the book before I knew um, I'd ever be in a play of the book. Um, in fact, I recommended it for a Radio 4's A Good Read. <laughs> Someone had told me about it, emailed me about it, said, you must read this. And I thought it was the most fantastic piece of work. And as you said, read like a novel, but also for me was just the least sentimental um, and most clear-sighted book I think I'd ever read on, on poverty and Indian poverty in particular, and there have been many books. Um, so I recommended it. And then when I found out it was going to be here and most importantly, it was going to be with Rufus, and David Hare was working on it. It's kind of a no-brainer, really. So. You were saying before that there, were, that there are certain pitfalls that one could go down in trying to tell this kind of story, aren't there? Well, yeah. Um, you know, I think the phrase that Catherine uses a lot is poverty porn. And um, I think it's a very relevant phrase because a lot of the time that people have tried with the best intentions to write about the poor of India, they always end up with a sentence, something like, yes, they have nothing, but they're probably much happier than we are. <laughs> they could teach us so much about life. Um, and actually, it's balls, because there isn't anyone in that slum that doesn't want to be out of it. I mean, 
and poverty makes you ingenious and it makes you rough around the edges and it makes you greedy and desperate. In fact, it makes you a whole person like any other person, except in straightened circumstances. And Catherine's book never shies away from that. Talk a little bit about the person, the character you, you play. Um, Zeranissa Hussein is one of three Muslim families in the slum and therefore does stand out. Um, and is the object of a lot of jealousy in the slum because she happens to be the rubbish pick, the head of the rubbish picker's family, and they're the most successful family there. And so at the beginning of the play, she's kind of queen of the slum. She's uh, the family that are most successful. And she also has nine children. So she's juggling that huge family, a sick husband, and a very successful business. Watching it um, last night, you, it, it seems like a part that you can have a real a lot of fun playing. I mean, not least because it's, it's wildly profane as well, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, did, I it get just, to swear a lot. It just sort of <laughs> seems to leap off the page, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it does. I mean, I, you know, so a lot of um, the, the dialogue, uh, you know, David has, has, you know, taken from Catherine's book and then made it into his own. I mean, there's a lot of synthesis between the two, the two works. Um, one of Zeranissa's early lines is, uh, look behind me, you see me shitting coins. And that's actually one of the things Erinissa said. There's been a lot of, um, you know, the, the way she talks is salty, but it's, it's actually very true to how she is as a woman, I think. And you and David went on a sort of a fact-finding research trip? Yeah, we went for a, a, a week about a year ago, just over a year ago, with the designer and had a week uh, in the, every day, just getting up every day and spending the day in, either in Anawadi or... Um, going to various other... You'll see there are various locations um, that the story visits uh, just to go there and, and spending quite a lot of time with the core characters. Um, uh, and, get, you know, we went to one or two other slums, um, just, just absorbing as much as we could, yeah. And what was it... How did it... What was your reaction to... Because you'd not been to India before, had you? Or? No, I hadn't, no. Um, well, overwhelming. I mean, you know, fantastic. Really fantastic. Uh, and you know, quite quite um, quite sobering. A week isn't very long. I mean, you know, I've travelled quite a lot, and the and the, the 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 challenge when you've only got that amount of time is to get over the wow, isn't this you know wonderful and exotic, and aren't these people just totally gorgeous, and I love them all, <laughs> to actually sort of get a, get underneath that and sort of do the work, which is to try and absorb something about the atmosphere or the or the you know the detail. Actually, what you know, I think. I think what Catherine's book really does brilliantly and what, uh, you know, and what the, the, the challenge for us and, and, you know, something that David's really, you know, grappled valiantly with. The, one of the first things that, uh, w when I read it, um, I, 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 uh, I phoned David up or dropped him an email and just said, I just want, oh, I'm sorry, it's a really stupid question to ask. I just want to know one thing. Why did you write it? Why, what, what do you want to say? And his, and his whole thing was very much Catherine's thing, which is to show that the people in these circumstances are as complex and as ambitious and as uh, conniving and loving and everything as uh, all the rest of us. And the politics in this little community are the same in that big building with a, ch with a clock tower over there and on the fourth floor here. Um, and everywhere else, it's just, um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, it, they're just people, they're just people, and, and that distance that you inevitably get by going, yes, they're really colourful, and, and oh, they're really poor, and all the rest of it. So, but I think for me, the, the challenge in the week was just to get, get all of that stuff out of the way, get over the tourism aspect of it, and really try and discover. But in terms of the text, the t the Hare's text is obviously a distillation of the book because you can't have everything in it and it creates a narrative which is slightly different from the book. Um, how did you distill your week of experiences and bring them onto the stage? What, did you, what were the specific things that you thought, if I have to boil this down, this is what I want to try and take onto the, put onto the stage? Um, I don't, in a way, it's, it's, I, I don't know. It, because you just, it becomes about just being open and seeing what, what details you, you carry with you somehow. I know that's not very useful, but, but things like... It won't mean anything to the people who... Are, and I hope it won't give anything away. 
But, you know, there isn't, it's, not, it's no secret, I'm sure, won't be any surprise to you to know that there is some conflict that happens between these neighbours that live in this very, very, very small, uh, compressed community. And just going, going there two years after it had all happened, or three years after it had happened, and seeing them cheek by jowl, and the most unexpected alliances, knowing the history of what had happened between those families, and the fact that they are, you know, that they are, that they're completely, you know, looking after each other's children, you know, when, when they've been at, at the greatest state of conflict with each other, because they because that's what you just have to do, you know, that the the the, the Hussein family have one one room and. You imagine with 11 of them, that's one room, it's got one bed. Uh, so everybody else sleeps on the floor outside or slept in their back room. Their back room they sold and there's now a sheet between them. And if you imagine selling one of your bedrooms and there's this, you know, there's a sheet between this family of 11 and another family of 11 and that's it all the time. And I think just trying to, trying to appreciate the complexity of... Uh, of that, and what that means about what you share and what you don't share and what you don't worry about, um, is that it's that sort of energy that uh, you hope kind of feeds. And like millions of photos, we were there during the Navratri festival, which is part of the show, which is which is very fortunate. So we got to see several different uh, several different sides of it. You were talking about in terms of channeling the character and how you how you play it, but as we were as you've mentioned before, these are real people. Mm. Do you have to kind of forget that when you're playing them, or do you have to keep that very close to you? Um, I don't think you can forget it. Actually, I think it, cer it, it, it certainly brings a maybe responsibility is not the right word, or maybe it is. But a word that came up a lot in rehearsals was honour. Was how do we honour these characters? their stories and this material, and also David's play, because, of course, you also are in a play and you have to honour the arc of the character in the play. So it's a, it's a fine balancing act, but um, I think principally it gives you a really different energy when you go on stage. You're thinking much less about, you know, how am I going to do tonight, and much more about... I mean, I have Zerinissa's picture up on my wall in the dressing room, and I do think every night... I really hope I tell your story truthfully and that you'll be, you know, that I'll honour everything you've been through. And I think everyone in our amazing cast is also thinking the same before they, they go on stage. I mean, it is a huge, huge cast, isn't it? I mean, in terms of, did it create a sense of, it's almost like a mini community <coughs> in terms of the people here? Yeah. Yeah. You don't do this very often, do you? So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, you you just get some media training before, before April. <laughs> no, 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 he, he's the enigmatic one. Oh, okay. to, yeah. no, I've got these eyebrows, I sit here and be <laughs> silent, let other people think that I'm thinking deep thoughts all day long. Um, yeah, no, it did. It create, well, it's, there's several aspects of that. There's three things to, to say about that. They are an incredible bunch, and they've been amazingly committed for, for all the reasons that Mira was saying. The second thing is that this is a little slice of history. It's the first time we've had a full British-Asian company on this stage, in the history of this theatre, and that is a mark of the age that we live in, and it's about time, and that's been a real privilege for me to be part of that. Uh, and the other thing is the fish rots from its head, and the company, uh, any company, is led, uh, and with you know, obviously, if you're playing, if you're if you're putting on a production of King Lear, then the actor playing King Lear is inevitably the leader of the company, and in this case, Mira is the leader of this company. And can you tell the others that, please? <laughs> <laughs> And it's I really don't think I'm paid quite enough respect. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's completely infectious. So they're a very, very happy company because, because if Mira's not going to strop around and, and do the I'm the big TV star, uh, then nobody else can and nobody else does. I don't think they would anyway. No, they're a gorgeous no. bunch. Um, yeah, and it is a complete And we community. feed each other constantly. Do you it's a great, that, that's a great thing about being in an Asian company. There's just loads, oh, loads of, food. of food. It's brilliant. All the time. I mean, it's usually, do you not find that there's probably more Asians on stage than there are in the audience? But, more, <laughs> but when I was there last night, for example, it's bringing a different crowd, isn't totally. it? That's, that must be quite validating. It's brilliant. And it's, you know, it's what Rufus always said he wanted to do, and it's happening. And, um, you know, we found this doing Rafta Rafta a few years ago, which um, Nick directed, that... You know, it's the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. I mean, there's a very hungry audience out there for, for you know, good plays, good stories. Do you think this could have... Do you think you could have staged this ten years ago? I don't know. I think, I, I think in two ways it would have been difficult. From the simple, pragmatic point of view, 
Um, the bottom line is, if Mira had said no, we would have been in a certain amount of trouble um, because uh, for lots of complicated uh, reasons to do with glass ceilings and also, uh, I think, uh, the, you know, British Asian culture, the, it, it, there hasn't been uh, a wealth of um, strong actors from that community uh, historically, and, but it's getting much, much stronger. So now you can go, OK, if you look at the young people in the cast, they're, they're fantastic and, and, and they're growing in number. I mean, it, you know, it, I think, I hope I'm not generalising horribly to say that 10 years ago we could have done Death and the King's Horseman or we could have done the Amen Corner and did, in fact, or, or those sorts of plays because with the black community it happened, it happened earlier for, mm. you know, for various reasons which probably not, this isn't the right time to go into. So I think from that point of view it, it would have been difficult. Now, the other question is whether or not there would have been an audience um, pre-Slumdog Millionaire um, and you know the, the, the you know the very excellent literature that's that's come out in the last ten years. I, I, I don't know. Certainly, it's easier now. And how long do you think it is before instead of David Hare, it's Dilip Hari or somebody who's writing these kind of plays? Well, I think in a way that's part of you know wearing my other hat. That's that, that's part of the responsibility. You could equally say how long until until it's you know the person who's in my position is. Has a, has a deeper connection to that, to the m material. I mean, I don't, you know, of course I don't believe that a writer, uh, you know, has to write from their own, you know, uh, only from their own uh, kind of practical, pragmatic experience because it's, a, you know, it's much more about the emotion and the politics and everything else. Um, and I obviously feel the same way about directing. But um, I, I think if I manage to not get fired... Um, by the time I leave here, I would hope that we're in a, we're in a, you know, we're in a, we're in a different uh, place. And for people who are trying to sort of read the runes and sort of get signals and things, what does the fact that this is one of you, you know, this production, what does it tell us about your leadership coming in from April in terms of the sort, the store you're trying to set out? Well, look, this this is a broad church, and we do we you know the, it, uh, we will do a broad range of work over the next few years, as, as has always been the case here. Um, I, 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 was, I, I was offered this job and took this job of doing this play uh, a long time before, um, before, I'd even con before I'd even put an application in. So, um, but actually, if you look at the work that I've done, even on this stage, uh, three of the four last uh, ones I've done here have been, you, you know, have been very culturally diverse and... and it's no secret that that's my childhood. I didn't grow up here, and it's something that I feel very passionately about. Um, so I just hope that you know that the, the good work that has been done in this organisation will will continue in the direction of us representing, in in a very meaningful way, the the in, you know the city and the country that we all live in. And just picking up on that, we were talking before about. Um it's, it's really, there's many stories, but the two, uh, very, one part of the theme of the stories is um, of two very strong women who are kind of, they sort of rub each other up the wrong way, but they represent different poles, and they're both really, really strong, dynamic characters, which again is quite a, must be quite a nice thing to be playing off that in that energy in the room. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's just fantastic. There are so many incredibly strong women on stage and um, totally reflective of of what happens in the slum. I, I had some friends who work for an NGO who came to see it the other night and have done quite a lot of work in slums all around the world, and they said, actually, it is generally the women that are running these places. Um, not because the men are weak, but the men are sicker. The men are often doing a lot of the work that shortens their lives, and the women are actually holding up uh, the family and a big part of the workforce. So that's totally reflective of the world that the play set in, but just, you know, on a, on a general note, it's just... Great to see strong women out there. And do you think, I mean, we were talking before about the, the representation or the comparison between that and television, as in, you know, the, the character you're playing on stage here and the kind of the freedoms that you have. Do you think you'd have them in television? Or is that, is, are, the, are the two genres moving further apart? They seem to be, yeah. I mean, um, you know, I did something recently where I was playing the mother of an actor four years younger than me. <laughs> I know, and they didn't even bother to make me look older, so I thought, <laughs> this is going to be really interesting. When I saw his name on the cast list, I thought, oh, great, we must be playing husband and wife. No, no. 
And of course, you get 60-year-old men running around with 30-year-old girls as their girlfriends, and nobody bats an eyelid. I mean, you know, television has its own kind of weird set of reality, and I think that's why, you know, theatre's always been ahead in that sense. One of my first jobs, I was playing a 17th-century Essex village girl who also happened to be a deaf mute. <laughs> Can't call that typecasting in any way. <laughs> my whole part was in sign language; it was at the Royal Court, and that, and you know, that was in the late 80s. So in that way, I think theatre's always so theatre not only reflects reality as we think it is, but also how it could be, how it should be, how it was. Television is stuck in this weird kind of version of its own reality sometimes, and actually it's, it's very rarely actually on the pulse of the, the kind of integrated society that we all live in. Yeah, Rufus, Mira was mentioning that she has a photograph uh, on before you, uh, before you go on stage. Is there going to be any kind of interaction, communication between the people in Anawadi and this production? Are they... Yeah, I've got a I don't know what time it is now. We've got a meeting at what we call the five, which is the five... Uh, the five is five minutes before the show goes up, or it's actually ten minutes before... So 20 past seven, where we'll meet as a company to discuss um, what we want to record, uh, which is the message that the company will send... Uh, so they'll have to scratch up on the Hindi to the residents of Anawadi because Catherine's going out uh, the week after next and is taking a recording of the play. And... They will sit around in Anawadi and A video watch recording? It. Yeah, they'll, wow. just, they'll just watch it on her laptop um, uh, uh, probably several times. And, and, and yeah, we, the, the, I'm, I'm, you know, we, we've got to work out what the, what the company uh, can say to them to just uh, honour them. Wow, yeah. that would be, be amazing to, Won't to be there. Are they going to give you notes at the end of that? <laughs> no, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It's 6.45, so we have to go so that you can enjoy the play. So could you please join me in thanking Mira Sayal and Rupert Norris. That's it. That's great. <laughs>